So that really is a critical kind of crossroad, right? A lot of make-to-order companies have a hard time planning and planning effectively because they don't see the big picture. They only see a project at a time and they don't see all projects in a single view and what their requirements are from a top to bottom level of a bill of material, right? Think about bill of material that could be 10 levels deep or could be 20 levels deep, 30 levels deep. Growing a business requires a holistic approach that extends beyond sales and marketing. This approach needs alignment among people, processes, and technologies. So if you're a business owner, operations, or finance leader looking to learn growth strategies from your peers and competitors, you're tuned into the right podcast. Welcome to the WBS Podcast, where scalable growth using business systems is our number one priority. Now, here is your host, Sam Gupta. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the WBS Podcast. I'm Sam Gupta, your host and principal consultant at independent ERP and digital transformation consulting firm, Elevate IQ. The ERP needs of make-to-order manufacturers are completely different from the make-to-stock ones. The make-to-order manufacturers need to collaborate with their customers during the design phase. And even after finalizing design, there might be several change orders. These iterative changes make planning extremely difficult for the make-to-order manufacturers. And understanding these nuances are extremely critical to implement an ERP for a make-to-order manufacturers. In today's episode, our guest, Nirav Shah, shares his insights into process challenges of make-to-order manufacturers. He also talks about the order and product differences of make-to-order manufacturers and how that impacts the downstream ERP processes. Finally, he talks about planning and scheduling processes and the value MRP brings to make-to-order manufacturers. Let me introduce Nirav to you. Nirav has spent his whole career in ERP consulting and sales. His focus is on end-to-end ERP implementations, strong emphasis on manufacturing and accounting solutions. He has studied using Apex materials and have an undergraduate degree in supply chain management and MBA in accounting. He has implemented ERP solutions in over 100 customers to achieve high return for his clients. With that, let's get to the conversation. Hey, Nirav, welcome to the show. Yay! <laughs> This is going to be so exciting, right? We have been waiting for this for a long time. So obviously, it is going to be so exciting to learn about your experiences. For the listeners who might not know you, do you want to start with your personal story and your current focus, Nirav? Yeah, absolutely. Sam, thank you for having me on. I'm excited to share my story and my knowledge to your user base. My name is Nirav Shah. I've been in ERP consulting for a little bit over 18 years now. Um, I've been implementing in all different industries, order to cash, AR and AP, complex manufacturing and financial environments, um, working with many different solutions, actually, you know, starting with Glovia, part of Fujitsu, then been in the Microsoft Dynamics channel for a long time, and now transitioning and working with the Acumatic uh, channel and still working inside Business Central, which is Microsoft's um, latest solution that's a predecessor to NoVision, essentially. So my experiences lie in factoring, distribution, um, make to order, make to stock. My background is in supply chain management where my, I graduated my undergrad degree, studied with um, Apex Materials, which is the American Production Inventory Control System, yeah. uh, knowledge base and books, and also went on to do my MBA in accounting. So, you know, when, when you look at supply chain and manufacturing and how it works with finance and making sure the financial team is happy with the manufacturing team and manufacturing team is happy with the finance team, um, you know, I have a good, uh, you know, experience in that area that I could talk about these processes very naturally and help, you know, both sides of the coin. Yeah, by the way, thank you so much for breaking down Apex. I had no idea what that stood for. So thank you so much for doing that for us. Now, you know, obviously we are going to have very exciting uh, things to discuss in terms of your experience. But we have one of the standard questions that we ask every single guest that come on the show. Okay, that is going to be your perspective on business growth. Yeah. Business growth is interesting. Every business is in different phases, I feel like. And, you know, there's pre-revenue businesses. Yep. There's businesses that are 
in essentially startup mode where they're actually got a little bit of revenue and they're building, they're setting on their foundation and they're building blocks. Yeah. And you got those businesses that are kind of in growth mode where they've kind of got some success through QuickBooks and some, you know, smaller solutions like that. And, and now they're ready to take the big jump into an ERP system, a full blown integrated solution. Right. Yeah. And then you get into enterprise, which, you know, they've grown so fast um, or over the years. Now they need a bigger solution to help manage a multinational kind of functionality, right. uh, which could be various different taxing authorities They maybe have expanded into different business models. So they need a more enterprise level solution. So, you know, in those different phases, there's different needs and requirements. But luckily, there are solutions that you could implement now and, yeah. and get a hold of now that in the SMB market where you could use pre-revenue all the way up to almost enterprise and an enterprise make a very easy transition switch into a bigger product that fits your needs from a multinational standpoint. So, um, you know, I always I always tell customers that don't don't, you know, put yourself in a position that you're going to do double work. Right. And that's that's rule number one for any consultant. You don't want yeah. users to do double work. So yeah. if, you, if you take time out in, in educational material, learning what's in the market, right, kind of having that vision of what's my business now and what's what it will be in the next year to five years. Yeah, that should your timeline on the best product to choose from a uh, system standpoint, right, ERP standpoint. So when you decide what that is and what that plan looks like, it almost immediately, almost always will turn into, we need an integrated solution, right? We just can't have, um, you know, finance working in their own silo or their own world because ultimately, right, you're going to increase your buying power. You're going to get more material, assuming that you're in distribution or manufacturing. You're going to you're going to get a bigger warehouse. You're going to get more people to manage that inventory. Now, you actually want to prepare for that by getting a system that already has these talking points between the different modules. You may not use it phase one, but you could at least now start using the financials maybe initially, but can very easily transition using inventory and you know warehousing and stuff like that, right? That transition is much easier versus starting off with the system that's only dedicated for financial purposes or only dedicated, you know, doing Excel or other, you know, point of sale solutions, you know, uh, and now it becomes harder because now you have data in there that's unusable, and now you're trying to move to the next step. You're moving to the next, you know, phase of the of the organization, and now it's a little overwhelming because you know you're stuck in certain ways where now a new employee has come into the business. They're in charge of finding a new system. There's a lot of bad processes. You know, the predecessors created a bad chart of accounts, for example, right? And now that doesn't match to if you were to start stocking inventory or managing inventory in the system on the balance sheet side, right? It just becomes a little bit more work, becomes redundant work. Whereas if yeah. we started to lay the groundwork up front early on where someone that understands the vision of the business and then you 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 work with somebody that understands how ERP processes flow and how different you know modules talk to each other. Yeah. Right? That transition is easier ultimately, right? And and you're basically saying for an SMB product, you could take someone using you know that's in pre-revenue all the way up to you know growth and stabilization phase until at some point they say, hey, you know now we have five, six, seven different warehouses around the world. Yeah. Um, now we need, now we need to do taxing with you know VAT or GST and sales tax all in the same system, or we need a system that has three, four different five languages because we have manufacturing all the different uh, parts of the world, right? Now we're looking at okay, now let's transition into a more bigger enterprise product. Now that's a, a logical goal, and you have everybody already in the mindset of using an ERP system properly, where that transition is less invasive, if you will, for a uh, company. Yeah, so some amazing insights there. And my personal takeaway, and I'm probably trying to take the notes because I'm trying to learn from you as well. So you mentioned that do not do double work. But when we look at the ERP space, especially when I look at my customers, okay, re-implementation is probably going to be a reality. Okay, every single customer goes through some sort of re-implementation phase because the way you are going to be doing the first time, it's probably not going to work. And then you are probably re-implementing it. So probably yeah. take this advice that, you know, figure out, you know, how you can do things beforehand so that you don't have to do double work. Yeah. But let's get yeah. into the story that you had related to your make to order and machinery experience. So I don't know yeah. if you're going to be able to share, you know, the kind of business that you work with. And, you know, yeah. I am looking for any sort of specific challenges that you have faced, because in my mind, when I look at all of these businesses, they all have their own nuances. And typically, mm -hmm. a lot of ERP consultants, they all think that, you know what? 
you know, whatever I've done for business number one or the industry number one, it's probably going to be the same for the industry number two. But typically, that's not the case. Okay, every industry okay. has very specific nuances. And if you can don't really understand those, uh, you know, sometimes uh, it, it just doesn't work. So what has been your experience when you are working with this space? What are the specific nuances that you have seen in this space? Yeah, that's a great question. And that space in general, I would say, is a complex space. Yeah. Right? The make order space because you're dealing up front very uh, intimately with customer requirements. You're building product that's meeting the customer needs specifically. It's not like you're taking something off the shelf. Yeah. And you're saying you're going to use it the way it's off the shelf, right? The way it's been already engineered because that's uh, a common product that's used the same way all the time. A make-to-order situation, you are heavily involved with the customer upfront in a uh, analysis, a yeah. design, approval phase of a particular product, and you are tracking that time. You're tracking those costs in a project environment, typically. So yeah. you have different things in a project. So you need to be organized. The system has to be organized enough or intelligent that when the users are actually upfront before getting even into inventory planning or shipping or any of that is making sure the project is organized so every user of that project right understand what's to do what the next step is to do or what steps are in the project that we need to complete or we call tasks right yeah um, that's number one right you need a system that's going to keep you organized and a system that's going to allow you to put in budgets for specific projects right because you're going to get there's a lot of moving parts you want the right level of detail yeah you want to make sure it's not overwhelming where you're, 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 you are putting in too much information. A lot of that information maybe is not adding any value to your bottom line or right. into the project, right? Because there is a fine balance of the information that you have to put into the system that you're going to actually get good, good decision-making reporting out of. So the project setup and the analysis and how to set that project up front is very critical, right? There has to be some thought around that. What are our major milestones and how we're going to capture that, right? Then we get into, right, how are we going to start bringing in and looking at different en engineering points, right? Yeah. When I say engineering points, that's talking with our engineering team, our application engineers. That team is developing what has been agreed with the customer and our business, right? The yeah. drawings, right? Customer use cases, right? They're making all of this decisions in different CAD systems and different PLM systems ultimately, right? Creating bills of materials and understanding what that industrial routing looks like for that particular item, right? So as these items are being made in another system, how are we bringing those items into your ERP system, right? And then ultimately building those bill of materials in the ERP system, right? It doesn't make sense again, right, to double enter. If you have a bill of material that's already ready to go in PLM, you want to very easily bring that into your ERP system right. and then associate those items to different uh, points of use, meaning at what points will you manufacture certain items in the project, right? Or where you need to buy certain items in a project. What's that visibility look like, right? Because that's going to help a little bit down the road, right, with that revenue and invoicing side of it to make sure you have the right invoicing points meant if you're doing milestone billing or percentage of completion. So then what happens is once you cut, when you get to that level, you've organized your project, you're organizing your PLM system that's integrated into your ERP. So the visibility between customer requirements and items that need to be manufactured, inventory, purchased is very clear, right? Yeah. And along with you know, finance because you're rolling up costs, making sure it meets margin criteria, you know, all that stuff. You're going to put together possibly maybe a quote of all that information, right? That like you're going to go through a quoting phase and send that quote to a customer, right? And that customer will come back, you maybe have three, four different iterations of that quote, and the, the quote's gonna be accepted, right? And, and then we really get into the nuts and bolts of a project. And when I say that is, is really executing the project, is now you have all these items, you have these bill of materials, you have these routings in place, it's now letting the system do its work, right? Having run MRP and MPS. Right yeah. now, that is a lot a challenge for a lot of companies that don't have a true planning system, that don't understand exceptions, how to manage exceptions or suggestions that the system is providing. Right, MRP and MPS, when run, you know, um, on a daily basis, is actually a very effective tool to streamline your planning process. It takes out any of that tribal knowledge that somebody has, right? And in, in these big make-to-order companies, you're going to find that there's people with tribal knowledge. And that tribal knowledge is hard to get out and put into them, right? Right. Uh, but once you take that knowledge and you put it out, 
in the planning side, right? You're having the system do the work and the users are now managing exceptions and optimizing the planning process. So now instead of you having to think about every detail of planning, right? Keeping that Rolodex in your head of how long a vendor takes to, you know, ship you something or which vendor is the best for this part or, you know, you know, what is our quantity breaks for a certain item? Yeah. Right. Or what is our optimal ordering quantity for a specific item? Let the system handle that. Now you are concentrating more on the business than in the business because the planning process will allow you to now look at these vendors measure the vendors against on-time delivery, measure the vendors against quality, measure the vendors against cost, right? And make better decisions to ultimately lower cost and, you know, lower your inventory carrying value and get higher quality products in the door. So ultimately you are then meeting your timelines for your customers, right? So when planning is done correctly, there's a lot of benefits, right? The biggest challenge I find um, on the planning side for make to order companies or manufacturing is that, a lot of people don't want to let go of that knowledge. They they are they're, they're tied to it. They're somehow married to that, right? And and the breakthrough moment happens during an ERP implementation is when we're saying this ERP system here is not designed to take away your position. It's not designed or being put in place to um, you know make your job harder, right? It's really yeah. designed to make your job easier. It's really designed for you to succeed as an employee of the business of the role that you play in the planning process. So it's really designed to make you succeed. It's not there to take away or, or, or kind of become a, a, a bottleneck in that specific area, right? Once we have that breakthrough moment, the planning process becomes an art, not a science, right? When I say art, it's the ability now to see very quickly, either graphically or through lines and rows of, of, of different exceptions, how you're doing overall in the planning process, right? Where are your bottlenecks? <clears throat> where are your planning? Um, where, where are your planning optimization points? You know, where can you maybe add um, some more capacity, right, to increase your throughput, right? Now you're actually getting to data that's actually going to be meaningful to the business to to meet right the requirements not only for that project. But think about a make-to-order environment. You're running maybe 60 projects at a time, 70 projects at a time, right? Now you're ordering in the aggregate. You're not ordering, you know, on an order-by-order basis or project-by-project basis, right? Some things that are order-specific are being ordered in an order for a specific manner, right? You're able to, to quickly see, you know, when, when demand dates are changing. Let's say the customers called in and said, hey, um, you know, we don't need this product for maybe another two weeks, right? Now you want to be able to react to that. Essentially, right? You want to see these exceptions come to the planning worksheet. Give me a reschedule message, reschedule in or reschedule out. Or or let's say the customers canceled part of the order. Well, all right, well, let's react to that. The planning process will show us that we have to go ahead and cancel this particular purchase order as a suggestion. And now I can have a meaningful conversation with the vendor, right? What do I do next? So that really is a critical kind of crossroad, right? A lot of make to order companies have a hard time planning and planning effectively because they don't see the big picture. They only see a project at a time and they don't see all projects in a single view and what their requirements are from a top to bottom level of a bill of material, right? Think about bill of material that could be 10 levels deep or could be 20 levels deep, 30 levels deep, right? When you're dealing with these many different components, there's ways to optimize, right? Planning process um, and take away, taking out the human element of it, letting the system run and, and uh, do its job essentially from an MRP and MPS standpoint. And then now, you know, being able to make better decisions um, from an inventory control standpoint. So planning is huge, right? Uh, planning, if done correctly, is going to really help you meet your due dates and lower your margins at the end of the day, right? Um, obviously, with supply chain issues right now, right, ERP and the planning plays a big role, right? So what I always suggest and what I'm suggesting to customers now is go back and revisit what do your lead times look like in your ERP subs, right? Update those lead times. <clears throat> Once you... is Planning is not a set it and forget it type of system, right? System Planning system doesn't run well that way. You have to be proactive, right? If your vendors are delivering earlier, well, let's update our lead times. If we know that there's an economic downturn, something's happening in the economy, right? For example, we just saw in COVID that there was a huge, right, uh, back order of supplies on the ocean in containers, right? We couldn't get to it. We have you know, we don't have enough workers. We don't have trucks on the ground. Well, you know, we should have maybe tried to put in a little buffer once we started experiencing this a little bit. So the system would, would account it a longer lead time to get things on order quicker, 
right? Instead of waiting, you know, what the regular lead time was, right? We could have the system react the way we want it to react, but we have to be proactive about it. Um, and, and, and so we don't see, you know, some of these uh, downturns or, you know, any of these you know, things that are happening in the environment. We could kind of pat ourselves, right? Buffer ourselves for it. Um, so as we kind of go through the business model for a make-to-order environment, from planning, we have, you know, purchasing and production, right? When pr- purchasing production, there's a lot of people that don't know what another person is doing in that, in that, in, in both those departments. Purchasing is buying, production is producing, right? But a lot of times you're releasing production orders when you don't have enough inventory on hand, right? Or you're purchasing things that maybe you don't need right away. Now you're holding that inventory, right? Or the inventory might go bad if you're doing lock control with expiration dates, okay? So it's really important what comes out of the planning process is sterile and is clean. And it makes sense from a timing standpoint for all the different departments to use that data um, at the right moments in the manufacturing and planning process, right? And the process. Fine. You know, we, we're going to receive inventory in, okay? When inventory comes in, we want to make sure it goes to the right projects, right? Task lines, right? <clears throat> right costs are assigned to it. It's important for finance because finance is always looking at, well, hey, the invoice is going to come pretty much right after you receive in the goods, right? Nowadays, a lot of times I'm hearing customers get invoices before the goods come in. These vendors are really fast at invoices, right? So, yeah. you know, you're doing a three-way match really fast, you know, with, with the PO and the invoice and the receiving document. So it's really critical that the PO is done with the right cost in the system. So you're not kind of playing, you know, this this Tom and Jerry or this cat and mouse, you know, game all the time between finance and uh, purchasing, right? Where your purchase, your finance never trusts any of the PO numbers, that purchasing is doing and, 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 you know, purchasing things that finance, the finance team is just slowing them down. Well, you know, when we have, you know, a better kind of symmetry or a uh, better dialogue and communication between both the departments, when you have, you know, data, that's good data in your ERP system, right? And then you could see, uh, you know, prop, proper results coming in from the AP side, essentially for finance. Um, on the manufacturing side, it's important, you know, what tools are you utilizing? to complete these big projects, right? A lot of times these production orders are related to each other. When I say that, that they're, you know, um, you, there's dependencies between production orders. You have to complete lower level production orders first before those materials could be issued to higher level orders, right? So there's reservations that happen. There's picks processes that happen, right? Picks have to be generated. They have to be issued timely uh, in order for production to do their work. Um, a lot of times in the production process, you're also looking to capture labor, after, to capture time, right? Shop floor time capture is important, right? What type of machinery do you have on the floor, right? Is that optimized? Where are your terminals on the floor in terms of doing the, the, the shop floor time capture, right? Is it, are they close by that they could go ahead and, you know, scan on and scan off very easily um, for, for the user base, right? And there's other tools to do that too that will help you scan on and scan off, right? From a shop floor perspective. So it's, it's really critical to understand um, you know, what are you missing? Okay. A lot of times companies will add routers to their, um, you know, to their items or have a, a routing associated, but they will have really bad labor data. So they will have no idea exactly, you know, uh, what their time studies are. Do we have the right setup time and run times associated to our routing steps and to, to our operations? They'll have no idea because that never, for them, it never changes because they haven't taken the time to study that. Right. It's important to study, do a continuous feedback saying, okay, what, you know, how did we do this month in our shop floor time capture, the labor that we captured against our routing steps? Okay. What are our critical points? These critical points, how do they relate back to how we set our routings up? What is our setup time? What's our runtime for piece? Do we need to adjust that? Right. And let's adjust those to make those a little bit bit more accurate. Right. Because a lot of times you're buying machines that are doing three, four different processes at once now. These machines are complex, they're efficient. Right. They're they're not our traditional old school CNC machine. Now, don't get me wrong. They're still out there and which is good. And they have a purpose and they do a great job out there. But a lot of these machines are super fast and technologically advanced out there. A good example are these simply nesting machines, nesting machines, you know, like they'll go and cut, you know, a sheet of steel, uh, sheet, uh, you know, a sheet of steel or aluminum. Right. And in five, six different shapes in four or five different production orders. Right. Well, now we need to capture that, capture that data. Right. Because. It's taking one person cutting, you know, 50 pieces of forming 50 pieces of a specific product. But now it's taking a machine that's doing maybe 150 pieces of three, four different production orders all at one shot, right? How do we capture that effectively, uh, right? And with the right, right consultant, a right 
um, you know, a company that understands discrete manufacturing, that understands how these pieces work, how they need to be integrated back into the system is critical because, you know, capturing that data is going to be valuable in understanding what your true margins are, what your costs are, and where you can eliminate waste, right, in the, in the manufacturing process. Uh, along with that, you know, you need to also be able to be very, very um, agile with make to order environments, right? Because these are pure, a lot of engineering's involved, right? So as you start producing top level items, the bigger, the level ones, level twos, level, you know, uh, zero type production order items, they're heavily tested, right? If there's any sort of kind of failure in that area, they're gonna have to decom de de deconstruct that. They might have to put inventory bag, they have to get, you know, put new bill of materials on there, right? Because they're testing these things in a constant basis before they release them to the customer. So it's really important to find the system that allow you to be very flexible, you know, at certain stages of the manufacturing process where if you have to issue material out of WIP on a production, you'd be able to have to do that very quickly, right? If you need to issue material in, back into WIP, how do you do that, right? Even though it's a little bit outside of the standard bill of material that was originally set up the item. Okay, because you know that, that it's, it's very liquid, it's very fluid at that moment, right? When you're doing when you're when you're getting very close to uh, assembling and and sending the product to the field to maybe get installed on the field. So this you know that that you know the final few few production orders in the process get very important. You know how do you manage that? How do you manage the cost of that? How do you have the visibility of all these different transactions that are take going in and out, right? Pluses and is in that product. It's important for finance, you know, to understand what that is, so they could call, compile what is our profit and loss for this project. Right. One person that's, you know, doing testing for 16 hours may have gone way over budget for that particular production. Order, right. I mean, it's important to see that. Well, you know, how do they log their time? Is it is it reflective in work in process? Right. And what happens going back a little bit on the job side is finance. You have to understand is they're periodically they're running what they call per job whip or what they call project work in process. So they want to see actual costs. Well, how much cost have we incurred in this project to date? Even though that project's not over, they want to see, well, we need to recognize some level of revenue. That's a million dollar project and you've completed 60%, right, of some costs, right, whatever that is. Well, they need to recognize $600,000 to 60%, right? So they need that continuous feedback of what, what costs have been included or uh, recorded against production so then finance could get the real-time numbers they need to properly report their revenue on their financial statement, right? And you have a good system and that continuous feedback and the actual costs are coming always constantly coming back into the job or the project, then finance could are able to do their job and be able to, you know, complete their financials on a timely basis and report whether, you know, projects are, are, are need, need some a little bit more attention because they're going over budget. Or they're projects that are you know tracking well and they're within within timeline and within budget. Okay, so amazing layers there. Obviously, there's a lot uh, to digest there, and then obviously you know a lot. There's no question about that. But you know when you look at the make to order, if you are going to be speaking with a lot of different people, right? They all are going to have their own perspective in terms of what is make to order, uh, what is engineer to order, and sometimes it will be all over the place when you are going to be defining these things, and it's very, sometimes very hard to understand. For example, in your case. You mentioned the project-centric manufacturing. Uh, some people in the RP community, in the manufacturing community, they might not consider that as make-to-order, even though it is actually make-to-order because you are making to order literally. Uh, you know, but from the process perspective, sometimes the definition varies, and that's why it is really important to sort of dig into the real business model, the product, and the story. So I don't know if you're going to have any sort of story that you might be able to uh, mention. Which are the business that you are talking about? make to order and the challenges yeah. that you were trying to describe. So do you want to share that story as well? Absolutely. So, you know, make to order, um, you know, challenges lie in a lot of kind of what I kind of talk about, right? It's going to be the planning. It's going to be project. Uh, it's organization of the project, right? It's going to be um, getting the real-time costs back to the project and completing, you know, uh, you know, the project on a timely basis. And then there's a service component, right? Make to order really comes down to, as you mentioned that Sam, it's, there's customer input, customer drives a finished product at a certain level, right? I'll say made to order because you're, you you are some part of that bill of material is made to stock. Could be a, a maybe maybe the lower five or six levels of that of that bill of material is made to stock, and the remaining higher level right uh, pieces of that of the bill of material is made to order because you can configure that right. Now you, now you look at another side of that. You have engineer to order, right? That's maybe full top to bottom, you know, fully customized right, for a customer, right? And yeah. then you have configure to order, 
right? Configure to order could be that they're using a configurator, right? And uh, the customer is building their bill of material as they see fit, essentially, right? But there's what they call um, template bill of material, the template sequences in the bill of material that they are able to select. But ultimately, you know, based on the different options and things that they're selecting, they're building, they're configuring what they want. Okay. So when I look at make to order, a lot of companies fall within that category. Make to order, right? This is uh, this company that I'm talking about was a packaging company. They okay. made big packaging software, big packaging machinery. So think about like Kellogg's, right? Um, they need a big silo on top of, you know, a can that, that brings in product. That product comes down and gets weighed in the same machine. There's like a bag cutter in the machine. There's some jaws that cut the film from that particular machine. It creates the bag drops the product in the bag, it weighs it again, it dries the product, dries the bag itself, and the bag falls down on the bottom of the of the machine and sits there and it gets moved on to another place into another cartoning or something like that, right? This was a machine, this was a company that did heavy machinery um, kind of packaging equipment, yeah. essentially. So that was, you know, the make-to-order example that I'm giving. There are other examples of, of my experience in terms of make-to-order that we did. Uh, there was a company that uh, we called, you know, what they called themselves an engineer to order. That's kind of the case where they didn't have any level of the bill material was not make-to-order at all. Every, uh, make-to-custom, uh, make-to-stock. Everything was make-to-order. Yeah. So when they cut, they, when they cut a, a sheet, of, sheet of metal, sheet of steel, right, they, they might not cut that same way again, ever again for another customer. Right. So that was full configuration. Bill of materials were unique. The same bill of material didn't exist in the in, in in their system. Right. They would never use that same bill of material again. So that was one that was very true in terms of engineered order where, you know, they build. They're very heavily relying on their PLM system to build all this up front, you know, with the with the graphics and all that. And then we, we create an integration to their PLM system directly into their ERP system to bring in their bill of materials and their items when they were finished and released out of the PLM system, right? And then we went through a, a process of uh, essentially a workflow for those items that they went to the proper departments to get quoted for purchasing, got the right price or roll up from finance, right? And then ultimately strung together by engineering to get give the final approval. Oh no, actually, no, sorry, put in the bill of material and the routing against that against that particular item. Then finally got the final approval and were, was released to go onto a project so then it could be planned out and essentially go, you know, through the manufacturing. So there's a, there's a, there's a lot of different examples out there, right, um, of different type of make-to-order uh, type companies out there. But they all, in my opinion, um, uh, all have the same common denominator is that they are very heavy in terms of customization up front and then like the finished good product. They have, you know, when they look for an ERP system, they are currently yeah. coming off for planning process. So ERP is a big consideration for them. Um, and also that um, they need the ability to have better financial tools. So they're able to project their revenue and their expenses for their projects a lot clearer to their stakeholders uh, in the business. Okay, so amazing. So when you are working with these make to order and the engineer to order business, and in some cases, you mentioned that, you know, there might not be two products that are going to be similar. And then you also touched a little bit on the MRP and MPS process. So when you are going to have, let's say, a project or a job or the product that you are building that are never going to be similar, then is MRP or MPS still going to be relevant in those cases? Or do you skip that? Because some customers, when I speak to, and if they have never done MRP or MPS process, for them, let's say they are going to be completely custom shop. For them, mm -hmm. it's very hard for them to visualize how they are going to fit their business model into the MRP process. Uh, they simply cannot understand. So let's say if you were talking to those guys and uh, you were trying to sort of advise them why MRP is going to be important or if MRP is going to be important for those custom businesses. So what would be your perspective on that? Yeah, I would say if anything, you know, if you don't use MRP and MPS for anything else, it's just the auto creation of purchase orders and production orders. Right is the ability to not having to type in field by field purchase orders and production orders, right? You could run your products through MRP and MPS, right? And and use the results as you will and just quickly convert those into production orders and purchase orders and, you know, go ahead along your way and receiving those items and not, because you're not going to get exception messages, right? If you're running it on a pure custom shop, right? This item is not going to be ordered again. You, and let's assume that you don't have inventory of the item either. It's going to come up and say, just go ahead and order it. Right. And it gives you visibility of all the items you're ordering from a single vendor. So yeah. instead of you know having to figure out how many purchase orders I have to create, you create one purchase order with five, six different items on it. 
that you release from the planning, you know, what we call MRP and MPS. And you're not having to worry about creating multiple purchase orders, right? It just kind of still takes out, eliminates a lot of those extra steps that you'd have to do manually. You know, I'm all about, all about automation. The more you can automate and have the system do a lot of these things that, you know, what I kind of sometimes consider it could be, you know, wasted time or uh, not a value at a time yeah. for a user. We don't want them to data entry specialists. We actually want them to be on the business. We want them to make on the business decisions. Who are our best vendors that we should be working with? You know, who, you know, why, you know, why does this customer always keep changing, you know, their order? It's, just, it's really affecting us in the supply chain, right? How come our costs are so high, right? These are questions and this is where you get the most value out of ERP system. The value is not there to key a key in orders. The value is not into, you know, punch in data, right? The value is to understand the data and make better business. Yeah, so very interesting layers there. So now I am actually going to give you a scenario from the customer's perspective. And as you mentioned, automation, right? Everybody is sort of trying to automate and that could mean a lot of different things as well, okay? So let's say if I'm the customer and I am running a custom and in my mind, when I am sort of trying to create these orders, so what I do is I am going to have my bomb. I'm going to dump that in, in a spreadsheet. I upload my bombs are created because these are sort of the engineer to order bombs. They are never going to be used again. So what I'm doing is I am sort of trying to create all of my bombs and items and products in one go just with one spreadsheet. OK, and then the next thing I'm going to do is I am going to upload my purchase order because some systems, if they are not on the ERP yeah. system, those systems are going to be super flexible. They let you upload whatever you want because they don't care for the data integrity as such underneath, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so here they are going to, so these businesses, the way they operate is, okay, one spreadsheet, bombs are created. Second spreadsheet, your POs are created. So from their perspective, if you really think about it, you know, it's far more automated because in the ERP system, even though you are claiming that, it's going to be more auto automated, but I'm probably looking at 10 or 20 different clicks, and then I have to figure out what this MRP is. So yeah. <laughs> what would yeah. you say to this person who's trying to say that, no, 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 my automation is better because I got only two clicks. But in your case, well, you are trying to say that, you know, it's going to be far more automated. So what yeah. is going to be your uh, advice or perspective in that case? Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to go back to what I uh, was talking about when we first started talking. Yeah. I'm going to go back to is look at your business, not what it's doing now. Look yeah. at your business, it's going to do next year or in five years from now. That's the rule, right? Just because you're doing that now works for the way your business is currently. All make to order companies that I've worked with, they all eventually, or even engineer to order, their goal has been to become at some level make to stock. And now that's a little different to hear, right? From an engineering perspective, they want to be able to standardize parts of their bill of material instead of having everything so custom, right? So engineering is always tasked with how can we standardize this? Why do we always have to have this as a unique item, a unique bill of material? Yeah. Right. That's always the goal for every engineer to order and every almost every make to order company. Right. I won't talk. Maybe not every, but let's just kind of put a number out there. Let's say 75. All yeah. right. So if you fit that goal, if your mindset is eventually I want 50 percent of my bill of material to be more make to stock. I don't want 100 percent to be all um, engineer to order, make to order. I want 50% to be made to order, 50% to be made to stock. Then the conversation is, well, okay, let's look how we're going to optimize that, right? And how are you going to be able to do this with the least amount of clicks down the road, but you're getting the most amount of data in front of you to make the best decision for your business. And that's always going to lead to best practices. And best practice is always going to be to use MRP and MPS because that ultimately, once that data is flowing through there, you're, you're seeing it not on a piecemeal basis, you're seeing it for the whole company. You're seeing all inventory that's being requested and being able to make better judgment calls as business grows, as the model changes, right? You're going to be able to work more on the business. So I'm, I'm going to go back to, hey, yeah, you're doing this now, this way. Yeah, it's great, right? But let's let's take a step back here for a moment and let's implement what you're doing now. That's fine. Let's implement that. But let's have in our roadmap a phase two to say, let's look at MRP. Right. Let's look at MPS because that ultimately is going to give you a lot more value. OK, amazing. So that's it for today. Do you have any last minute closing advice or remarks for our listeners? You know, your listeners are very educated. They're very smart. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm happy to you know, be on the show. I'm happy to take the conversation offline, be able to help, uh, you know, you know, script out any processes. You know, I love talking about ERP. This is the only thing I've done in my career <laughs> is ERP. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm happy to share any experience I have, and I'm still a student. I always feel like there's always something new to learn in ERP, and I'm always excited to learn about different different projects, 
different success stories as well. So um, well, however I could contribute to anybody, you know, more than more than interested to kind of give back. Okay, amazing. And my personal takeaway from this conversation is going to be make sure the shops have a lot of complexity. So make sure you are paying attention to that. Uh, it's going to be a very different business model. On that note, I want to thank you for your time and insights. This was a powerful app. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Appreciate it. Of course. I cannot thank our guests enough for coming on the show, for sharing their knowledge and journey. I always pick up learnings from our guests and hopefully you learned something new today. If you would like to learn more about Nirav Shah, head over to Adsaras ERP. It's A-D-C-I-R-R-U-S-E-R-P.com. Links and more information will also be available in the show notes. If anything in this podcast resonated with you and your business, you might want to check other related episodes, including the interview with Nick Foy, who shares his insights on the reasons for ERP implementation and adoption failures based on his team's experience in saving Odoo implementation. Also, the interview with Abu Asif, who shares his insights into the processes of cannabis businesses in Canada. Also, don't forget to subscribe and spread the word among folks with similar background. If you have any questions or comments about the show, please review and rate us on your favorite podcasting platform or DM me on any social channels. I'll try my best to respond personally and make sure you get help. Thank you, and I hope to catch you on the next episode of the WBS. Thank you for listening to another episode of the WBS Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. For more information on growth strategies for SMBs using ERP and digital transformation, check out our community at wbs.rocks. We'll see you next time.